Good to you guys. Well, good to see everybody. Um, we can make to this session of Stefana. I work with the group of Yonder here at Providence and also in the Washington Consulting. So, um, today's presentation includes two different topics. In the first part, we will be talking about early onset neonatal sepsis. In the second part, we'll cover milk and fats of breastfeeding. So, I don't have any um, conflict of interest um, or confessions to make. Objectives of today's presentation, uh, part one will include, we'll discuss early onset sepsis, its risk factors and presentation, uh, we'll discuss current recommendation uh, for evaluation of early onset sepsis, we'll discuss Kaiser uh, sepsis calculator, and we'll use three studies, case studies to use on a fly uh, early onset sepsis calculator. And in the part two, we'll discuss some common myths and facts about breastfeeding, uh, we'll discuss what's normal, newborn weight loss, motorcycle supplement, Tim the baby, and Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine recommendations. All right, just a quick review here. So, newborn sepsis, um, it's a clinical syndrome that usually includes two things. You will have an infant who has signs of infection, and uh, you will have a positive blood culture test and new, new, newborn neonatal sepsis um, includes infant from birth to 28 days of life. It has two subcategories. Um, it divides um, on early onset sepsis. It's suspected or proven infection in the baby within the first seven days of life, which we see a lot here in the hospital. Well, we don't see a lot, but that's the group of uh, population that we will see here. Um, and then late onset sepsis uh, with onset of sep uh, symptoms, seven plus days. It can happen anytime within the first 90 days of life. All right, so signs of early onset sepsis in newborn actually can be anything. So anything concerning that you see in the baby can be a sign of sepsis. So it includes um, respiratory distress, apnea, high or low temperature, feeding difficulties, hyperbilirubinemia, alguria, uh, less frequent uh, pneumonia and meningitis. And also, neonatal infection can also be asymptomatic. So those infants, very, very small category, but very small to present with any symptoms. And the only way we can find out they have infection by uh, doing some tests on the CBC and blood culture. Um, as you probably all know, because you've been working with uh, labor and patients and newborn patients. Some of the highest risk factors that have been associated with developing sepsis includes chorionitis, or as currently known, intra-amniotic infections, so infection of amniotic fluid, placenta, membranes, decidua, maternal temperature of 38 or above in Celsius, uh, delivery at 37, less than 37 weeks to station, so preterm babies. Uh, prematurity, maternal GBS, colonization, uh, previous infant with GBS disease. So be careful here. So it's um, so it's the sibling who actually acquired the disease, not the mom who was positive with the GBS infection with the previous pregnancy, but the baby who actually was diagnosed with sepsis and documented uh, GBS bacteria during current pregnancy. And last thing is prolonged rupture membrane. So anything above 18 hours. The good news for CDC, the rate of acquiring early onset sepsis is pretty, pretty, pretty low. So it's 0 0.5 per thousand newborns. And actually in our community here in Everett, it's even lower. It's 0 0.3 per thousand. So it's pretty rare. And we do see a huge decrease of uh, incidence of sepsis uh, due to implementation of um, antibiotics, maternal antibiotics, um, antipartum. Because in the past, the, before implementation of antibiotic, the incidence of uh, newborn sepsis was much higher. It was one to four babies per thousand. All right, so then well, why is it such a big deal? Well, because it's devastating. So 5 to 30 percent of the babies who do develop sepsis die. And preterm babies have a high risk due to the maturity of the immune system to develop um, sepsis. Um, so the most common bacteria or pathogens that cause newborn sepsis or early onset sepsis is group B strep, 
followed by E. coli and less common uh, Staph aureus, Hebe, and Listeria. So GPS. It's a pretty normal inhabitant in the GI and GU system, right? It can colonize perineal area, skin area, can, um, can colonize pharynx, so it's usually not a problem for the mother. And as you guys know, it can be intermittent. So the same woman can test negative in the beginning of the pregnancy, and then she can test positive at the end of the pregnancy. So the general recommendation to test pregnant women for GBS um, bacteria is between 35 and 37 weeks. And the test is usually good for five weeks. So let's say if mother was tested at 35 weeks and she goes to late term and or post term, ideally she should be retested in five weeks. Okay. And it's pretty common. So we see about 15 to 35 percent of our pregnant women do have uh, colonization uh, with GBS. How does the transmission happen? So it's a vertical transmission from mom to the baby, either during the uh, the delivery process or with the prolonged ruptured membranes with the, when the GBS colonizes a vagina, cervix, get to the uh, membranes, fluid, decidua, affects both placenta and affects newborn. Uh, also, transmission can happen after delivery from person to person uh, and it can be acquired in the newborn nursery from healthcare providers or the visitors due to the bad hygiene. So, practice not just gelling in and gel out, but actually hand washing for, for the babies, for, I would say for all babies, not all babies, not only the babies who are at the risk. Alright, so I have a case study uh, to, uh, to demonstrate you and maybe practice on how we diagnose um, early onset infection of uh, sepsis and what, what we do about those babies. Alright, so let's read it together. So we have a newborn who was X38 weaker was born vaginally four hours ago. Mother of this child is 18 years old. She is G1, B1. She was GBS positive. She was ruptured for 19 hours. Her other prenatal labs are negative. She was rebelling immune. She did have some limited prenatal care. Uh, her highest interpartum temperature was 38.2. She was treated with penicillin times three, four hours prior birth. And this infant for the last four hours has been a little bit of tachypnea, right? So respiratory rate has been between 68 and 90 since birth. And heart rate is pretty normal, 140 uh, to 158. O2 has been pretty normal, 296 to 98. And temperature has been normal. So what are the concerning factors that we see here? What are the, what are the red flags? Rupture, 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 right. What else? GPS status, yes, <coughs> two. Maternal temp, yes, of 38.2, that's right. Take even your newborn, that's right. So let's see if we got it right. Yep, so you covered pretty much everything. I would also say limited prenatal care, right, and she even sits in pregnancy. Um, so what are we going to do? Are we worried about this baby? Yes, no, maybe a little bit. Right, so there's a lot of guidelines, and for those who have been working in this place for those five years, you guys probably have seen all of them, right? So we've been using AAP guidelines, we've been using CDC guidelines, Red Book up to date, and now we just started using about a year ago, Erlen's and Sepsis Calculator. And you will see the similar situation everywhere in the, like in, in the country right now. So about 50% of facilities still use AAP guidelines and CDC guidelines. Um, early onset calculator in 2017, it was about 18-15% um, of the facilities starting using it, but it's been two years since um, we started implementing, so I'm assuming no facilities using the U.S. calculator. Alright, so quick look at the current or the guidelines that were being used in the past. The CDC guidelines, I think it was um, published in 2010, which is the same thing as the Red Book guidelines. And actually, this guideline in the Red Book, is, it's, it was published in the new edition of 2018. So per Red Book, they're still using the old recommendation. I'm not going to go over all of the columns, uh, but let's quickly review. So for the babies who did have some signs of neonatal sepsis, those babies automatically would be transferred to the NICU and we will start antimicrobial therapy. We'll do a lot of tests on those babies. For mom with choriamnitis, you probably remember labor nurses, right? We'll do some evaluation on the baby, but we'll start uh, babies on antibiotics. 
if mother was positive for GBS, was treated adequately with penicillin, ampicillin, or cefazolin for uh, at least more than four hours. We would observe for 48 hours. Um, then you have a baby who's been uh, full term versus preterm, and this is uh, the recommendation. So what is the problem? Why, why do we need to change those recommendations? What was the limitation? So first of all, it, the guidelines didn't, clean, uh, di didn't clearly explain what are the clinical illness or signs of neonatal sepsis, right? So it would take an experienced provider, an experienced nurse, a nurse who's been working already with a baby who had sepsis in the past, to recognize those signs. And as you already heard, it can be anything, right? So how much and how many signs we take into consideration before we transfer the baby to the NICU. So that was one disadvantage. Oops. All right, so other thing, what was going on? So as you know, right, we've been, uh, oh, there we go. There was a cut, uh, cutoff in algorithm. So let's say the algorithm, algorithm was specifically talking about, well, highest maternal temperature of 38 is dangerous. Well, how about maternal temperature of 39? Is it as dangerous as maternal temperature of 38? Right? What about rupture of membranes? Does rupture of membranes of 18 hours as bad as mom who's been ruptured for 40 hours? Right? So there was no clear guidelines. Um, and also interaction between risk factors. So you have a newborn who was born preterm at 37 weeks, and mom was GBS positive, but was treated adequately, didn't have any fever. Does this infant has the same risk of developing sepsis as the full-term baby whose mom was GBS negative but who did develop temperature, right? So for that reason, there was some new recommendation. Uh, a lot of researchers were trying to find this, uh, the new recommendation or new protocols. Another disadvantage of the current recommendation, we were really over-treating newborns with antibiotics. So in the United States, the average was between 5 to 8 percent. So it's about 200 to 400,000 babies that we would treat unnecessarily with antibiotics because we just think that those babies may have a high risk of developing sepsis. So we'll just go ahead and administer based on the old protocols. Uh, and as you can see, percentage of infants being treated with antibiotics was 200 fold higher than the incidence of early onset sepsis. And as we know, the unnecessary evaluations lumbar puncture, uh, blood test, pokes, and antibiotics treatment, they are not risk-free, right? So when if infant truly needs antibiotic prophylaxis, those babies are sent to the NICU, they get separated from the mother, um, we interfere breastfeeding, bonding time, and then there is a clear association between um, early antibiotics uh, on the uh, risk of developing necrotizing enterocolitis, candida infection, and later on in life, asthma, obesity, and other uh, immunological diseases. So how can we come up with something that would still treat the baby, right? Or uh, find those babies who needed the treatment, but not over-treat over them. So that's how the group of researchers and medical providers from Kaiser Permanente System conduct, conducted this retrospective study uh, so they looked at um, more than 600,000 babies that are born in California and Mas uh, Massachusetts in 14 different hospitals who were 34 plus weeks of gestation. And they found a fascinating information. So basically, it's, it's really, really amazing. So the highest predictor for the baby to become, to acquire early onset sepsis was actually highest at departing maternal temperature. Look at that number, it's 60%. Followed by gestation age of the baby and the duration of rupture of membrane. And lastly, look at this number, only 2%. Do you see how it's been completely changed now with this guidelines? Like in the past, we would keep the baby whose mom was GBS positive for those two days, sometimes even do some invasive testing. Um, but study, this particular study, there are many others, but this particular study showed that we actually need to be focusing more on highest antipartum maternal temperature. So the temperature in labor prior to the baby's been born, right? This has high, higher predictor. 
All right, so if you have your uh, phones with you, just go ahead and pull your phones up and let's practice. Let's go ahead and Google Kaiser Calculator or EOS Calculator or Sepsis Newborn Calculator and this is what you're going to have. And we'll apply the information from our case study to the calculator and we'll just see if we, if we get the number correct, okay? So pretty easy to use, right? You just, have, you just need to have the information to plug it in into the calculator. So again, as a reminder, incidence of early onset sepsis in our community, and it's 0 0.3 per thousand. CDC recommends 0 0.5 per thousand, but in our community it's 0 0.3 per thousand. All right. And then you plug the baby's gestational age, highest maternal antepartum temperature, rupture of membranes, maternal GBS status, and type of antibiotics. As you probably all know, GBS specific antibiotics. So what do we use? Penicillin, Cefazolin, <coughs> <coughs> and Ampicillin. There's three that are supported by evidence. Okay, those three only would go into this category. Everything else will go to the broad spectrum. All right, so here's your case study. Why don't we put the numbers in the calculator and see what we get? Yeah, this is what I have. I'll just see if we have similar results. All right, no. so. <laughs> okay, let me go back. There we go. positive and she was treated with penicillin which is the GBS specific antibiotics, right? So there we go. So we put the numbers here, GBS specific antibiotics, the moment two hours, and I got those numbers. So do I really care about the first number, EOS risk at birth? I personally don't. It just kind of gives you a general information. Okay, well this baby has a risk of developing infection. So this baby's risk is 0 0.5 per thousand. All right? Do you guys have some questions there in the back? <laughs> All right, so what, what I really care is about these numbers. And as you can see, they're, they're, they're all different, right? And what does it say right over here? The risk after clinical exam. So does the calculator is perfect thing? Yes, it is. But your clinical exam is much more important to diagnose the baby with, with or predict the baby's risk to develop sepsis. All right, so how do I know what is equivocal means? How do I know what's the equivocal vital signs? What about clinical illness? Well, the good thing, you don't need to be that experienced. You're gonna go ahead and click because you have this little cheat sheets right here, which says clinical illness, equivocal, and well appearing. And when you click on that, this, this is the table you're gonna see, which is amazing. I use it all the time to remind myself, okay? So, look at the clinical illness. So, for those who work at the postpartum unit or labor, you guys probably not going to be really seeing this much because those babies are going to be automatically moved to the NICU. Because if the baby needs a CPAP, uh, persistent need for CPAP, right? Uh, if baby's um, hemodynamically unstable uh, or had some seizure or upper score at five minutes less than five or needs supplemental oxygen for more than two hours, those babies are going to go to the NQ and already going to be started on different things and different tests. So, but these two categories, I think, are really important for us. All right, so what is equivocal means? So to classify as a, having equivocal vital signs, your newborn has to have at least one abnormality for more than four hours, okay? So let's look. Tachycardia, so heart rate should be 60 or above for four hours. And then you can assign this baby to a clinical vital signs, right? Or take a secure rate of 60 or more. There you go. Temperature instability. Higher than 100.4 or higher, or less than 97.5. So in Celsius, it's going to be 38, above or 38, or less than 36.5. 
all right? Or respiratory distress, grunting, flaring, retractions, not requiring supplemental oxygen, okay? So if your baby has any of this for four hours, baby moves to the equivocal category, right? Or if you have two abnormalities in two systems for two hours, okay? So if you have tachycardia and tachypnea for two hours, and you don't have to wait for, two, for four hours, just two hours, qualifies to be to have equivocal vital signs, okay? Or you can have tachycardia and respiratory distress, all right, for two hours. That will jump the baby to that equivocal category. And will appear, if the baby doesn't need, meet any criteria here, let's say baby has a tachypnea for just one hour, okay, this baby is so far well appearing. If the tachypnea persists for two hours or four hours, then we may be moving categories right now. But at this time, at the time of your assessment, okay, that baby is just going to be well appearing. All right. So we actually go back here. So what do you think? What do you think this baby is well appearing? The baby is uh, considered to be uh, equivocal or has a clinical illness? So let's quickly look at the respiratory rate. Um, for how long has it been that? How, how old is the baby? Four hours. Four hours. So, so, so since, so let's so say, so equivalent. So That's right. So since birth, for the last four hours, four hours, baby's been to keep me? Equivocal. Equivocal. There you go. Mm -hmm. All right. So I would look, then I would assign this to the baby, and then would recommend us to do order blood culture in vital signs every four hours to 24 hours instead of eight hours, right? That makes sense. Okay. So that's what, that's how I use the color. To be honest with you, every time when the baby's been born, for myself, I always write those two numbers. So I know when I go to the room and I look at the baby, the baby looks great, then I will, at that moment, assign the baby well-appearing score, but I know it can change. So in my sign-out, I always keep this number because I know as time goes by, if the baby's symptoms get worse, I know what to do, and I know this number. Okay? All right, so let's move to the next case. So we have X36 weaker. Use your calculators. Born by C section. Originally, C section was scheduled at 39 weeks, but mom had a, a preterm rupture of membranes. She refused to lock, to lock. Uh, proceeded with C section. Mom's 36, G2P2, GBS unknown, which happens pretty common, right? We, we do have patients who've been uh, scheduled to have repeat C section, and sometimes they don't have GBS. You know, because we assume they're no, never going to go to the labor, but sometimes they do. All right, ruptured for four hours. Uh, maternal temperature was 37.5. She was treated with ANSEF, as every single woman who has a C-section, right, as a prophylaxis, not because of her temperature. Uh, signs. So respiratory rate being pretty stable, heart rate is pretty stable, oxygen saturation is normal. This baby was 36 temperature. You check in this baby's temperature. It's 36.4. You know as a nurse what to do. You put this baby skin to skin and you wait half an hour. And then you check this baby's temperature. And it's been half an hour, this baby's temperature is 36.5. So it's still a little bit low, right? Right here, right? So let's see what we got. So by putting all the numbers together, so mom unknown GBS, even though she received cefazone, which is GBS-specific antibiotic, right? But it was only given one hour prior to birth. So therefore, I'm instead of selecting this category, I selected this because it was given less than two hours, all right? And here's the numbers I see. Again, first number, I don't really care. Risk of birth, I don't really care. Those are the numbers that are important to me. All right, so this baby is, how old is this baby? 12 hours, 12 hours old. How long the temperature has been only an issue? I'm telling you, okay, so let's say 30, let's say an hour, because you, well, yeah, 30 minutes. Within 30 minutes. Within 30 minutes. So is this too concerning? Are we thinking this baby is equivocal, well appearing, or has a clinical illness? Well appearing so far. I, I think so. so, so far. far. Just because it's been only going for 30 minutes, and we know in order to qualify to be equivocal, right? You have to have to have abnormality either for more than four hours in one system, right? Temperature stability for four hours, or you should have at least two things going on for two hours. This baby's been so far unstable only for half an hour. So right now, for right now, it may change. I'm gonna consider this baby's well appearing. I'm not gonna order culture or anything else. I'm gonna do normal routine vitals. 
but just because I know there is a some uh, uh, temperature instability, I will probably going to ask to repeat the continue monitoring the temperature because they probably need to go under the warmer, right? If the skin to skin didn't help, the next intervention and then recheck temperature then, and it may change. So in my head, I'll be thinking, okay, so right now I'm doing nothing, but it may change, and then we'll baby will require blood culture for the test. Okay? Do you think you want another one more case, or we're good? Because I know we're running out of the time. Are we good? Okay. All right. There's if you guys want to. Uh, you can always, um, the slides will be provided to you. All right, so take home, look at the baby. Doesn't mean the calculator can, uh, can, can release the baby who could truly have sepsis. Unfortunately, yes, we can. Based on using calculator, it's really, really smidge, small percentage, but you can. So it's really important. We really rely on this providers. We rely on your assessment. Okay, so look at the baby. Any questions? All right, so let's switch. My favorite topic. All right, so we're going to talk about some common myth and conventional you know, wisdom about breastfeeding. You'll be very surprised how many times I hear those things from uh, my patients, from my colleagues, from my parents. So, and I think it's really important since we work in a hospital. I think as a healthcare provider, it's really important for us to know the facts, not just the myth. Okay. All right, myth number one, I hear it a lot. Formula is pretty much the same thing as the breast milk. All right, you don't need to be a scientist. You may need or may not to wear glasses, but I think for those who wear glasses, do you see the difference here? <laughs> so this is the molecule of the human milk right here on the microscope, and there's the molecule of the formula on the microscope. The density, the amount of the components is, is completely different. We're not gonna go too scientific into what it's made of, but again, even physical presentation, it's not the same, right? It doesn't look the same. So let's let's look a little bit closer. So I'm going to show you a quick video. <laughs> Try to ignore the dirty, but just to look at um, how the molecules look like in my So this is breast milk. Those bubbles. Are they swimming? Yeah. Yes, they are alive. That's right. Okay. And let's in a few seconds we'll see. And we'll see the uh, formula. The formula is not the same as the milk because what is, what is in the formula is what on the bottle, on the on the label, right? You have five, ten different ingredients. It definitely has some protein, it does have uh, some glucose, it has fat, it has some vitamins, some added nutrients, right? But that's all that you see in the bottle. The difference with the breast milk, there are millions of components that we know of, and there are probably not a few millions that we don't know of, of their function. But those are essential components of the human milk that are, are not in the formula. I'm not going to go over each of them individually, but I can tell you that they are very important because they do provide immunity to the to the infant. They help to fight inflammation. They help with relaxation, growth, growth, <laughs> and soothing. All right, and and I have a super uh, different slide on actually the benefits of breastfeeding. So just something for you know, for your information. All right. Well, someone always tell me, well, you know, you just need to feed the baby. That's true. And formula has calories. That's right. But the thing about breast milk, we don't really know exactly how many calories in, in uh, across the board, right? Because the amount of the calories changes for every woman depending on the time of the day, uh, gestational age of the baby, any illnesses, uh, if the baby was born early, preterm or postterm, it's all depend. But in average, what we know, colostrum or transitional milk has an average about 17 calories per ounce. Mature milk has about 21 to 26 calories. Formula has about 20, 19 to 20 calories, calories, right? Look at that. Calories in breast milk, they change in response to the frequency of feeding. More frequent feedings are associated with the higher milk fat content. Look at this, it's almost double. So when you have a patient who's losing a lot of weight, do you think it would be more beneficial to start this? 
would you ask mom to feed frequently? A quick dis disclaimer here, we're talking about full-term healthy babies and moms who don't have uh, health conditions that can impact their milk production. Right? Because for our preterm babies, or babies in the NICU, we do use different uh, feeding plans and methods. All right. And as I already said, the composition of the breast milk, it does changes. All right, as baby grows, it does change. Time of the day, it changes. Formula, you give the same formula to baby at one month, it has the same nutrients and ingredients, at six months, at 12 months, and so forth. All right, unless you're gonna be changing formulas, right? All right, and there are health benefits of breast milk for infants. We've talked about many of them, but just a quick reminder, yes, it does help to develop immune system and protect uh, the baby from infections. Uh, it helps their gut to be mature. Uh, it decreases diarrhea and necrotizing enterocolitis. It decreases the risk of neglect. It decreases risk of SIDS. Uh, baby's whole breastfed shows that they have a high level of verbal and nonverbal intelligence. It actually best for oral cavity development when the baby's breastfed, uh, and it does protect against infections. And recently, we've been uh, noticing that uh, breastfeeding is associated with higher immune response to vaccinations. Babies don't have the full developed immune system for the first three to six months, so it's crucial for them to get the immunity, uh, and they get the immunity or antibodies through. Consuming maternal mother's milk. And besides that, I always like to talk to my moms about breastfeeding, right? Because I think it's not only all good for the baby, I think they have to be motivated in something, right? For themselves too. And it's amazing because breastfeeding has been associated with decreased risk of arthritis, hyperlipidemia, ovarian cancer, breast cancer, type 2 diabetes, um, postpartum blood loss, depression, fertility. And here it's just, oh, it's a little bit harder to get pregnant, that's what it means. All right, and I love this phrase. I've heard it in one of the conferences, and I really, really like to use it with my patient. It's amazing, considering all the things about the human milk that are good for the baby, it supplies the baby with the nutrition too, right? By the way, it has so many millions of great things, but it's actually a food for the baby too, right? Sometimes I tell my patients who don't want breastfeed, I tell them, well, give the <laughs> Breast milk as the medicine. You know, just to put a drop of the baby, of your milk to the baby, just to provide the baby all of these important things that uh, breast milk can, can do for them. All right, myth number two. Newborn babies must eat every two to three hours. I've said it many times to my patients too. The reality is there's no really, we don't have evidence. We don't know how frequent and how long they have to feed. We know though that they should be fed frequently because frequent feedings, as we know, uh, associated with higher fat content in the milk, more frequent baby latches on the breast, more prolactin and oxytocin hormone gets produced. And when those two hormones get produced as baby latches and breastfeeds and sucks on the breast, it communi communicates with the maternal brain and telling her, there is a baby, produce and make more milk. And that's the circle, that's how it works. So American Academy of Pediatric, um, and I always forget the second abbreviation. American breast medicine. Breast medicine. Yeah, yes. breast medicine. They do recommend at least 8 to 12 feedings in 24 hours, which is kind of equal to every 2 to 3 hours, right? But I think it's really important for us to emphasize, whoa, 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 don't wait, right? Because I've, I've seen it too. Sometimes mom tells me, well, it hasn't been 3 hours yet. I haven't felt maybe because it hasn't been 3 hours yet. No, 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 no. At least 2 to 3 hours. Ideally more frequent, right? And we do know sometimes babies have those cluster feeding sessions. And I know how frequent parents get confused, or not confused, they get uh, just tired feeding the baby every hour or so. But that's a good thing. I usually tell them, well, you know what? Your baby born full of poop. They have to get rid of it, right? To prevent the jaundice. So when they eat a lot, first of all, it helps It helps to flush. Second, it, it just, it will stimulate your milk production. All right? So, and we need to teach parents about recognizing uh, hunger cues. Lip smacking, bringing hands to the mouth, rooting. Uh, don't let them wait until baby cries, right? Because when baby cries, it's so hard to latch the baby on the breast. So crying is usually the last cue. It's the latest cue of the hunger, all right? Um, 
All right, and again, why is that important? Alfred, you've talked about that higher fat content and more frequent mom feeds the baby, more milk actually she's going to produce. All right, there is no rules. There is no rule that mom wants to feed the baby on one breast for feeding, or if she wants to use both breasts. Breast, it doesn't really matter. But what we need to remember, when baby starts sucking, first the baby gets skim milk, followed by 1%, 2%, and then followed by whole milk, and then at the end the baby gets the high milk. So as the, um, as the breast get drained, the higher fat content. So I think what we can teach our parents, just make sure that the baby ends the feeding on each breast on their own before prematurely switching to another breast. Okay. All right. uh, this is my favorite one because I get the call about this probably at least once a shift. <laughs> All babies should be supplemented with formula if the weight loss is more than 10%. False. There is no studies that show that we have to supplement the babies or lose 10% of their birth weight in the first three days of life with formula. So we need to remember that weight loss is very normal. And in the first three to four days, while the mom's still producing colostrum, because they only produce a few dro drops mils per feeding, right? They're going to lose weight. Please teach your patients, yes, your baby's going to lose up to 10% in the first week three to four days, until your mature milk comes in. And when your mature milk comes in, your baby starts to regain weight, and they should regain weight around day 10 to 14, right? And remember that the main function of the colostrum is not to enhance growth. It's not to make those babies chubby, right, and big. It's actually to provide the immunity, to coat the stomach and prevent from pathogen invasion. All right, so normal weight loss, so 7% given. So normal weight loss for all babies is expected to be 7 percent due to the fluid loss, passage of meconia. Also through studies we know that if women, for labor nurses, if your moms get a C-section and if they get at least 2.5 liters of fluid, the baby is going to lose 7 percent. And you, you know better. How many liters your moms get? Is it sometimes 4, 2, 6? Right? It's a lot. So it doesn't mean baby is losing its own weight. Baby is getting rid of the, of the fluids of those liters that mom has received, right, in labor. Another thing, when we use an, uh, anesthesia uh, or labor medications, uh, pain medications, uh, epidurals, they do depress central nervous system of the baby. So like, they, they act like a sedatives. So they make baby sleep. And we, know, we kind of have this rule, oh, yeah, we know. Your first breastfeeding after C-section is amazing. It usually lasts an hour, right? And then baby kind of drops and get super sleepy for 24 to 48 hours. We see it a lot. Our job is to encourage mom to keep the baby on the breast, frequent feed, right? But educate her. That, that, that is normal because the medications of labor, right? All right. And weight gain should begin by day, by day four. All right, so here's some facts about poor more fed babies. How many times I come to the room and parents tell me, well, because you, when you give a parent a bottle of, that has 60 milliliters in it, I think we all think, well, baby has to eat at least half of it, right? But in the reality, so what do we know? So babies, formula fed babies, get about 114 kilocalories on day number one compared to 12 kilocalories that formula fed babies get. So formula fed babies get almost 10 times more calories on day number one. And then look further. Uh, formula fed babies consume 49% more milk at one month, 57% at three months, and then 71% more, more milk at five months. That's a lot. So when we think about weight loss, we need to also consider what supplement, what, what feeding methods moms use, right? Uh, and you will see more weight loss on uh, breastfed babies versus the formula fed babies because we're already overfeeding formula fed babies. So some things that I teach my parents if they choose to do uh, formula feeding, I teach them to use a paste feeding method, right? So when you just bring the bottle and put it horizontal to the baby's mouth, you Tilt the bottle, let baby suck for two to three times, and then tilt it back. Let baby to reorganize themselves. What I'm trying to do, I want a baby to pause between just gulp, 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 right? Because in the reality, on the first day of life, they only need five milliliters of that formula, five to ten, right? And if that baby would be breastfeeding, the baby would be at least ten. 15 to 30 minutes to get the, the 5 milliliters of that formula, right? And we're giving it over 5 minutes. So at least with pace feeding method, we can slow down that fluid uh, intake, okay? Um, 
All right, so this is the tool also actually being developed by Kaiser Permanente System. I don't have any affiliation with them, so no. But we, we're not using this tool right now, but if for you, if you're interested. So basically what they found that uh, type of delivery, vaginal versus C-section, and um, feeding methods are associated with a different weight loss. So if mom had a baby and delivered baby vaginally versus C-section, so C-section babies will lose more weight than babies who were vaginally, again, it's because of that fluid, extra fluid, and babies who are exclusively breastfed will lose more weight compared to the babies who are hormone fed. And if you want at home or at work, if you have time, play with this thing and just put your baby, you'll see a different difference between your vaginal and section babies. And I want us to read it together. So weight loss in range of 8 to 10 percent, maybe within normal limits, if all else is going well and the physical exam is normal, it is an indication for careful assessment and possible formula supplementation? No, possible. Breastfeeding assistance. Isn't that even interesting? So if everything is fine, if this baby looks normal, this baby just needs to be seen by lactation, because not just to be seen, but probably there's going to be a lot of hard work we have to do with this baby, right? But it doesn't say that we have to start jumping into the supplements of this baby formula. All right, they need to get us uh, breastfeeding assistance. And I think assessment is really important in these cases because we need to see what else is affecting that baby's feeding, right? Uh, what, what's happening? Is this baby has a problem with the latch? Is this baby has a tarm tie? What about the mother? Did mom have any conditions such as PCOS, hypertension, diabetes? And we have a lot of those moms right now. You work with them. All of this can affect feeding and milk, uh, milk coming in. Uh, also, did mom have any breast reduction or mutation? Right? Um, and let's don't forget about medicine and labor, right? All of the pain medication that uh, moms receive and uh, about uh, quantity of fluids, all right? I know we're kind of running out of time, so I'll just quickly uh, run through my slides. All right, so what should we do? You have a baby with 10% weight loss, lactation consultant. Boom, first thing to do. Don't even call the pediatricians. Don't call your providers first. Get the lactation consultant first, and then talk to the pediatricians. To be honest with you, not a lot of pediatricians have a lot of knowledge and um, education in breastfeeding. We only study breastfeeding for three hours in our curriculum. Medical school and, 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 and uh, nurse practitioner school, only three hours. So in order, when I started my job, in order, and I got a question about breastfeeding, I was scared to death. That's kind of prompted me to, to go and get my lactation education because I knew nothing and I, I was asked to start prescribing formulas or working with those babies with 10% weight loss and I knew nothing. So get the, thank you for being here. Get the lactation consultant to come work with the babies and call the provider and we'll work working together, okay? And they'll teach parents hunger cues, uh, tell mom, don't wait two hours until the next meeting, tell her to feed this baby as, as frequently as she can. Uh, I always avoid using pacifiers in bottles. What's the problem with pacifier? Pacifier replaces time the baby spends on the breast. When you, use, when you suck on the pacifier, you lose a lot of calories to suck. You don't get anything from, from that hard work, right? When baby stays on the breast, baby at least gets some benefit from sucking on the breast, right? Gets the, those calories. Um, again, no restricted feedings, hand expression. I want to emphasize it so much. There is no time that you have to wait before you start hand expression, okay? You may have your mom in the ICU because of the blood loss, and if her partner, while she's on the CU unconscious, her partner can start start massaging the breast. So we don't have to wait 12 hours, 24 hours. It's only going to help to promote the milk coming in, okay? Um, and pumping. Pumping is great. The colostrum is really thick. So if you notice when you're working with spartan, especially when you pump uh, the breast in the first few days, sometimes it's really hard to get this the, the thick milk out. It's just because the consistency of it, it's really, really uh, thick. And plus it's just a small amount. So what you left it with, you have all of the milk on the flange, right? So, I mean, that's fine. You can just wipe it and then put it in the baby's mouth. But again, hand expression is so much better in the first few days of life. All right, here's the picture how to do a hand expression because you'll be surprised how many times I've seen moms just milk in their nipple, right? So the technique, you make a letter C, you put it, I don't have a breast model here, but uh, so you put it in the, you know, make a C or U, and then mom has to first push towards her ribs, and then squeeze it forward, right? Not just milk the, the nipple. 
All right. And when you have to supplement, again, we always start with breastfeeding first. We always start with mom's milk first. All right. So we're going to be supplementing with mom's express, hand express or pumped breast milk. And then donor's milk if it's an option in some facilities, some hospitals, it is an option. I know for us it's, it's in the NICU, but not yet in the postpartum unit, hopefully one day. And then formula is your last resort. Okay? And let's quickly go by I have a few more things. Myth number four, mothers do not produce enough milk in the first few days after birth. I hear it all the time. It's pretty culture, it's very common in my culture. Right? People believe that colostrum is a witch's milk, they don't have enough, they have to give the formula at least in the first few days until the milk comes in. This is not true, all right? Through the studies we know, day number one, day number three, uh, you can see moms actually producing way more milk. Again, we're talking about healthy mothers with, uh, without condition that can affect milk production, all right? And an average baby takes only 67% available milk in the breast. All right, they don't take everything. And bread sucking is much better than pumping. You may hear sometimes your patient will tell, well, I pumped and I didn't see anything. Well, colostrum is thick, right? It's hard to pump it out. Better is, baby is much better pump. Baby will get much more by sucking versus mom even hand expressing the pump. All right, remember that and teach your patients. All right, uh, myth number five, mothers cannot make enough milk for more than one baby. No, they can't. It is a hard work, I can tell you. It is a hard work. But we know that moms of the twins produce twice as much milk as moms of the single babies. There are some studies of the triplets. Mom can even produce up to a gallon of milk. It is a full-time job, okay? And we are talking again about healthy full-term babies. For late preterms, preterm babies, that's going to be a different story because those babies not necessarily have a coordinated sucking reflex. They don't have a buccal fat, a buccal fat, right? Sometimes they just not very. We know twins in majority of the cases are born a little bit earlier. So again, it is possible, but it's it's 24 seven. So those moms, I think they need a lactation consultant on day number one, day number two, and often discharge for at least, you know, a few times a week, all right? Again, if it's their choice, if they want to supplement, it is their decision, and I really want to respect it, okay? All right, and this is my last, last slide. So again, as, as I already said, I do think that parents have a right to the information to make necessary decisions about the feeding methods they choose. And I think as a healthcare provider, we all, we have responsibility to share the information. Uh, but we need to support families uh, in, in their decision, regarding, this, uh, regarding the decision they make, right? Because they want to make sure that mom feels successful regardless of her decision to breastfeed or formula, all right? Okay, that's, that's all we've got. Any questions?